We are continuing this session uh, from chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Yes, chapter 5 is about Karma Sanyas Yoga. And in this entire chapter, we go deeper into the question of Sanyas or Karma yoga. This is a question that a lot of seekers ask themselves, especially in the beginning stages, when if they're very, very deeply interested in the matter, they have big questions in their life, they ask, is it possible to attain the highest if I continue to lead the life of a householder? Is it okay if I do not take sannyasa. And Sri Krishna answered these questions or questions about which path is more suitable, which path is superior. He said, both the paths lead to the same place. However, karma yoga is superior. He used the word vashishyate, which means superior. And the reason it is superior is that if you do take sannyas, thyaga, you renounce all worldly objects, worldly desires, but eventually find out that there are some worldly desires, you cannot live them out. You're stuck. If you are a householder yogi, following the path of karma yoga, you can do both, provided, of course, you, you lead a very conscious life. You can do both. You can practice yoga. You can integrate yoga in your life, as well as live out those samskaras that need to be lived out. I know that for many of you, this might be understood at an intellectual level, and I hope that with time, we will be able to integrate these ideas into our life. One of the interesting aspects of the Bhagavad Gita is that like many texts, it repeats itself. It keeps making the same point again and again. And the reason for this is that there is a gap between the seeker, the student, and the teachers. The scriptures are also teaching, basically, the same thing. But there is a gap between the teaching and the understanding of these teachings. Students or seekers understand things from their own perspective. And if I may say so without sounding arrogant, Seekers understand from their own limited perspective. All of us who are on the path would understand from a certain limited perspective. A teacher and a, who comes from a living tradition, from a living lineage, has learned the interpretation, has confirmed and verified these truths through his or her own practice. And... This is then confirmed through meditation. And then such a teacher hands down these interpretations to his student. Yes, uh, Vishal, you had a question. Go ahead. Hi, Radhika. Could you differ differentiate between uh, sannyas and tiag, please? There is no real difference between sannyas and tiag. Sannyasa is perhaps a larger term which implies the actually uh, oath taken for abstaining from certain worldly objects. <clears throat> when you take sannyasa, there are two kinds of sannyasa. You can take sannyasa by simply walking off. You don't need to tell anybody about it. And that is the non-ceremonial version. 
which is actually the higher version because what do you have when you renounce what do you have to tell anybody about and the second version is the ceremonial version where you have ceremonial rites you become a member of an institution these are called akharas there are many swamis there are hierarchies like for example in the church there are hierarchies and so you become a member of an institution so that is a more general term about sannyasa referring to sannyasis and the different kinds of sannyasis while tyaga is actually not enjoying physical objects or worldly objects sannyasa is a more general word it means renunciation but it can have many different meanings depending on the perspective tyaga becomes an external renunciation while sannyasa if understood correctly is an institutional um uh, lifestyle almost but so um most of the time when we talking about renunciation here uh, in these chapters is referring to either mostly external renunciation it doesn't necessarily refer to institutions it's just that these days the terms are used differently but here in the bhagavad gita the word sanyasa simply means tyaga they are used you know in they are interchanged the words they are not uh, used in the technical sense i mentioned this a Actually, couple of sessions ago that the bhagavad gita is being a part of the mahabharat was for lay persons these texts were read out during festivals and everybody including children were there so the the way it is presented is not very technical not very you know precise a text like the yoga sutra the language is very technical and very precise you can't change words around but here it's a little bit more fluid so and that sometimes is the difficulty with the bhagavad gita is that the text is interpreted by different people in different ways yeah um, i was going to say that that's always been um, i've always wondered if they're interchangeable terms in the context of the gita yes um but in a way i guess you've answered what my next question was going to be yeah. can householders um follow the path of a sannyas or is it literally i mean to my mind it was someone who went off to the himalayas was a sannyasi to me yeah. but you're saying in the context of the gita actually tyag and sannyas are interchangeable terms yes the um, path of the householder is different a householder can also practice tyaga to a certain extent in the sense that he is practicing various forms of tapas i think that was in the session before or or the or two sessions ago where we talked about different forms of tapas or sacrifice and we said that even a householder does spiritual practices can attain the same path and eventually the wise it is said do not argue about which path is superior because both paths lead to the same then only the external manifestation is different but we will continue repeating this again and again we will come back to this again and um, clarify this perhaps again at another point of time don't get too stuck on the words this is not a technical text like the patanjali yoga sutras where the words are very used very precisely and very carefully here there is much more room for interpretation so the verses 6 and 7 renunciation however mighty however almighty armed one is difficult to attain without yoga the meditator joined in yoga however attains brahman without delay joined in yoga of purified self having conquered the self having conquered the senses 
He whose self has become the self of all beings is not defiled even when performing actions. So this is referring to the aspect of sannyasa tyaga where there may be tyaga or an intellectual understanding of things as opposed to yoga which is the practice. Very often in this text, the Bhagavad Gita, they have used the word sannyasa or sam samkhya. Again, very interchangeable. What is meant is somebody who would renounce but is not really practicing some form of tapas. It may be more intellectual. It may be philosophical. maybe a lifestyle approach, but there is no meditation involved. So it says... You can attain even with both the paths, as we said, you can attain with both the paths, with renunciation, however, is more difficult if you do not practice yoga. A meditator, on the other hand, will attain without delay, which means it is the faster path. Yoga Sutra of Patanjali explains there are three kinds of paths. It says mild, medium and speedy, I think was the word. And so we have to, to make it a little bit more clear. You could take, you could go on a journey and you could take a bullock cart. You know, in some parts of India, they still have bullock carts. People still use bullock carts to travel. So you could take a bullock cart or... If you want to take the medium path, you could take the train. And if you're in a real hurry, and if you're prepared, you can take the rocket, you know, get into a spacecraft or a rocket and just zoom off. So these are the three versions. So you can say that those parts where you do not do real meditation are slow or medium. But the path where you learn meditation and if you have really mastered and got the key to meditation, that's the rocket version or an airplane if you will have it. So, once again, it is saying it doesn't matter that all the paths lead to the same place, but some are faster and therefore superior. If you're not in a hurry, that's okay. So, joined in yoga. Yoga itself means union. Union of what? Union of the individual, Atman, individual self with the universal self or the cosmic self. So such a person having conquered his senses being established in the individual self then having completely purified becomes the self of all beings becomes the universal self identifies with all beings and when that happens, you are not defiled even while performing actions. You cannot be tainted then. In other words, such a being has gone beyond the law of karma. And that is exactly what we all want, isn't it? Isn't that why we're doing this? Everybody says, I, want, I don't want to suffer. I want to find the path that leads beyond suffering. The path that makes me feel fulfilled. I want to feel connected. We describe it in different ways. Some of you have described it as want to feel connected. I feel very separate. I want to feel connected. Somebody says, I feel incomplete. I want to feel complete. I want to complete myself. The other person says, I'm, I don't have a fulfilling life. I want my life to be, you know, somehow meaningful. So we express this in different ways. But it all means the same. 
what we are looking for without even knowing it is becoming one with the cosmic self, with Paramatma. And while some of you may be doing this and not be really conscious that this is what you have been wanting, perhaps you have doubts and you say, hmm, that sounds so esoteric, that sounds so... Um, now, the, the, it sounds weird for me to, to put it in that way. I want the cosmic self, you know, that does sound a bit strange. <laughs> Especially in the context of modern times. Um, it seems odd to, to say I want to be enlightened. It's uncool to say um, I want to attain moksha. Though we express that in different forms all the time. And we feel sad or depressed or lonely or left out these are just ways of feeling disconnected that is our human existence and we all are striving to go beyond that and to feel connected with all of divinity of life then you ex experience that higher self. And some people say, oh, maybe it's not even possible. It sounds um, like only some great people can attain this and I cannot. And... Um, I would like you to contemplate on this idea that all those great people were once just normal people. In one of the last sessions we spoke, to, spoke about Valmiki. And Valmiki was a thief, a murderer, a bandit. And he became a great sage. There are many such stories from different uh, traditions of the world where this has been the case. In Christianity, for example, Saul uh, turned into Paul later, St. Paul. Um, though that was further back in time, in the last few hundred years, um, the patron saint of the Jesuits, St. Ignatius of Loyola, he was known to be also... Um, um, criminal who later attained some insights and uh, became uh, then the Saint um, Ignatius. So the path of yoga or practice can be done by both those who take sannyas, who renounce, or those who are householders. Both of these can do this. You can purify yourself and attain the highest. Any questions so far? Any comments? We move on to the next verses, 8 and 9. And these verses are quite important ones. Um, throughout the Bhagavad Gita, there are some amazing verses and a great deal of wisdom. But there are some verses that I say these are really uh, important verses. And these two, for instance, are extremely important. I do nothing at all. Thus should the knower of reality, joined in yoga, contemplate, even while seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, walking, sleeping and breathing. 
speaking aloud, eliminating, receiving, opening the eyes and closing the eyes. The knower of reality holds that senses are operative in the realm of the objects of the senses. So what these two verses are saying basically is one who knows reality always feels like I'm doing nothing. Even while he's seeing this, you know, touching, hearing, smelling, walking, sleeping, even eliminating, eliminating is excreting, a polite way of putting that, or opening, closing his eyes. So all the time he feels, I'm doing nothing. Did anybody ever try that? You know, try to do nothing while doing all these things? Gotham, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, Radhikaji. So, uh, it happened so, quite a few times where, uh, uh, where things are happening, but uh, I don't know who it is. Uh, so, there is there's a separate self which is uh, actually performing all the actions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, there's, uh, and then there is someone who is uh, kind of just uh, absorbing it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then, uh, and I realize uh, uh, who is watching it. Okay? Probably it's again the mind which is uh, splitting the, the subject into a subject and object. Uh -huh. So you start thinking then? Uh, and I start thinking about it. Right. So did, do, did that happen naturally or did you try to do it? Uh, both ways. I've tried doing it. When, when the trying is happening, then obviously there's a thinker. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Naturally, it has happened very few times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Shri. But I think now, as a practice, it, uh, it happens, uh, it's becoming more natural as, okay, there's mm -hmm. something which is happening, but uh, uh, I don't know what is driving this whole uh, action that is happening. Mm -hmm. What has happened is that um, in through, throughout history, since uh, these kind of texts, have become available, more and more easily available. And people have started reading these um, without having guidance, without having interpretation. Earlier, as you know, these texts were only available um, either to the Brahmins who were custodians of the scriptures. And uh, in the Brahmins, uh, it was a custom that the lineages, the Brahmin lineages were custodians of certain scriptures, not of all, but each lineage had a certain scripture they were kind of, you know, in charge of. And so they had to learn that by heart and then they were given some sort of explanation about it as well. Whether that was a, remained at an intellectual level uh, or not, that's another uh, story altogether. On the other hand, there was the yoga lineage, the traditions that handed down the wisdom of these scriptures together with practice. That means that these scriptures were interpreted in light of practice and these truths which are contained in these scriptures were then confirmed through practice. Now, in the last couple of hundred years, these texts became available in the form of books. Initially, only in, the form, in Sanskrit or in English, and soon also in many, many other languages. And what happened with that, especially now with the explosion of, of this information available in the internet, entire books uh, available, scriptures available, people read these verses and this is what they think. I do nothing, even when I'm sleeping, uh, hearing, touching, whatever activities, walking, breathing. So, what happens is that the readers think this is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to go around doing their daily activities, saying to themselves, Actually, I'm not the doer. 
I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm not the doer. I'm not the doer. And that has become like a mantra. Performing actions in the world and repeating to yourself like a little parrot, I'm not the doer or I am Atman, I'm not the doer, is not what this two verses are about. This approach is become very common among the neo Advaitites who read texts like these and say, I'm meditating all the time. I meditate 24 hours. And that's what this is saying. Experience that state. You are not the doer all the time, 24 hours, even while sleeping. Can we do that? I think most of us would very honestly say no. Because this is describing a state of a witness. Sakshi Bhava, one who has attained Sakshatkara, who has realized that what was explained in the verse before, identification with, with the self of all beings, the universal self. He is not defiled by anything because he's not really a part of this world anymore. He is a witness. Yet, this misconception is there very commonly in which is happening very commonly here in spiritual circles among people who um, not only are as beginners but even people who have been doing this since decades have been sort of trying to hypnotize themselves, talk themselves into believing that they are Atman. And that is not, that, is, that can be even dangerous. And the reason why it can become dangerous is that a person who keeps saying, I am Atman, I am not the mind, I am not the doer, gets into this delusion that he has somehow attained something, such a person would start neglecting the body because then you say, oh, it doesn't matter what happens, I'm not the body. Such a person can start doing whatever he, he wants to do and then says, oh, I didn't do it, that was manas, or that was ahankara, or that was um, my mind. And in effect, basically not taking responsibilities for his own actions or her actions. So, there is a subtle difference between pretending that you are the observer or pretending that you are, are really not doing anything and actually experiencing it yourself. And that's what the yoga, that's what Bhagavad Gita says. These are pretenders, mithyacharis, hypocrites. They are pretending as if they are in a certain, you know, attained a certain level. And then they say, oh, this doesn't bother me because I have attained this. I don't get angry. But what they're doing is they're merely suppressing the anger. They say, oh, I have no desires. But they're merely suppressing their desires. So this parroting of I do nothing, I am not the doer, I am Atman, I am pure consciousness, can be completely counterproductive, even dangerous, because you're going backwards. You're going even further away from the reality, from the higher reality. So it's important to understand that this is not an instruction telling you this is how you have to behave. This is a description of a state that we can aspire to attain. That's why I considered this 
to be one of the most important verses because these are also the verses that have been misinterpreted very often. Uh, Vishal says meditation in action. That's exactly right. This is meditation in action. We have spoken about this in great detail when we talked about the three kinds of karma. That is karma, vikarma and akarma. And we said that akarma means action which does not accrue back to you. You attain that meditative state where you are a witness and then everything that you do is meditation. The whole of life becomes a meditation. The whole of life becomes a sacrifice. Any questions or comments so far? I've got a question. Um, yeah. Theoretically, I understand it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I mean, I think I've been here before. Mm -hmm. But within myself, I think it's an unattainable thing. Because mm -hmm. it seems... Yeah. So I've got an inner belief that I'll never be able to attain that, kind mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. So am I already downgrading myself by saying that? Or? <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I, I think so. Fail, basically. Yeah, because I just believe. Yes, it is. Um, um, we all set ourselves up for failure in this in this way. If you believe you're not going to get there, then why bother to do anything at all, right? But you are still. I know that. I know you're still on track, and you are trying your human best, in spite of all the obstacles, in spite of all the difficulties, you're trying your human best. And so if you are trying, and if you are doing, it stands to reason that, it, that you too can attain it. Because if it were really unattainable, you would have given up by now. You haven't. I guess what I'm saying is, if we're going back to chapter one, uh... In a way, you're in a state of despondency already then? Are you saying that you kind of already set yourself up, that I, I can't do this? So, uh, the, the, the state of despondency that Arjun was talking about was quite different from what you're talking about now. Um, right. That's when you see and you're overwhelmed by this in meditation and you, you think, oh my God, uh, how am I ever going to do this? You know, and you say, oh, and you need just encouragement. You need somebody to to tell you how to do it. You you need guidance on the path because this has happened as a spontaneous insight to you, but you don't know the path at all. It's a new world that has opened up to you. That's what chapter one was about. What you're talking about is is somewhere inside a feeling of not being worthy. And we talked about this earlier, saying that even the most impure person, like Valmiki, even he could attain. So why not you? You are not a murderer, as far as I know, Vishal. You're not a thief. You're not a bandit. So why not? Just the other day, we had our session here in Germany that we have um, regularly. And uh, I asked one of our students who comes here on a regular basis and I said wouldn't it be wonderful if you would be like King Janak you know a royal sage and he started laughing because he could not imagine being a royal sage why not I asked because all of us tend to put ourselves down and this is not humility this is a lack of self-esteem, a feeling that only other great people can attain, but not me, and not I. That cannot happen to me. So th this is something that we need to work with in, um, in further sessions, of course, that we will come back to again and again. 
the doubts, the doubts that keep coming up from manas, you know, ahankara that creates these ideas, you are not worthy, you start identifying with it, that's your false identity, right? So these take over, and so you're lost in that old conditioning, old habit patterns. Shala asked um, the three karma. Um, I don't think so because that was uh, the, the aspect about karma, vikarma, and eka akarma was uh, a very very deep session. And if you're interested in it, you can look it up on our YouTube channel. Um, I can't tell you offhand uh, which uh, which session it was, what the title is. You just have to go look it up. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So, Ravikachi, when uh, uh, when uh, when the mind is actually saying that uh, I'm not the doer, or uh, mm -hmm. saying that uh, I'm just Atman, so it's still the ahamkara which is actually trying to, uh, uh, you know, in a subtle manner, saying that okay, you kind of reach that state and uh, uh, in that state of uh, uh, non-duality. Uh, so, and and this. Uh, the Amkar is becoming subtler and subtler, saying that, okay, it tries to uh, uh, be that Atman and, and give mm -hmm. that false in, uh, illusion that uh, uh, this is the self. Mm -hmm. is, is that the way it's, mm -hmm. it's happening? Yes, it, it, it can be. I'm not saying that everybody um, uh, uh, is hap that's happening with everybody. There's a lot of people who have not experienced that. And at higher levels, obviously, that does happen and it's not Ahamkara and it is the real thing. But... Ego, Ahankara, is so subtle and it plays tricks on you and this is one of the tricks. So if you have not done practice or you've not had a real spontaneous mystical insight somehow, then it is likely that just by reading books, you're getting this information, you're internalizing this at an intellectual level and then you start telling yourself, oh, I, I am Atman. It is actually ego saying that. It is Ahankara which has become so subtle that you cannot tell. So that's very true what you said. Uh, when, when we're talking of mystical uh, experience, so uh, would an intuition be called as a, a mystical experience or intuition is still at the level of the mind or at a notion? Is it... Uh, that depends on the quality of the experience. See, the word intuition itself is used in different ways, right? I mean, uh, so somebody would call uh, something intuition and I may call that purely instinct, you know, or just a guess or a hunch. So the word intuition uh, is not always clear to everybody. So what are... The word mystical, spontaneous mystical experience means having a direct experience of non-duality. And this experience is such that even a few moments of it, and I mean really moments, even a few moments of it can make you rethink your entire life. And a few minutes of it will transform your life so completely that you're going to be a different person altogether. And your friends, family will say, hey, what happened to you? You become strange. Because you start looking at the world in a completely, completely different manner. And most people generally will not understand what, you, what you're doing and what you're talking about. So, these are... Um, of course, things which are difficult to convey in words. Right. And, uh, and this experience can be completely uh, subjective. You know, each person can have different experiences. Is that uh, there's just no one standard experience? Uh, yes and no. In the sense that I have mentioned that the mind. Uh, is made up of the same components. No? If you analyze it, there's a manas, there's uh, ahankara, there's buddhi, and there's chitta. 
and you could be from you could be an american from america you could be uh, indian you could be chinese you could be german you could be any from anywhere it would manifest in different forms right but the basic aspect is the same there is manas buddhi chitta ankara what is in your chitta could be different because you're a different person from me what how how your identities are set up are completely different from the person who is living even in your own house your own family members so it manifests in different forms but the basic essence is the same so also these kind of experiences these spiritual experiences there is a certain common ground they may appear slightly different in in different ways for example somebody who attains a deep spiritual experience would experience all this world as um uh, as one you actually think everybody is connected it's not a intellectual idea it is an experience or you feel you have somehow expanded and become the universe it's not an idea it's not something to discuss it's not an intellectual thought it's an experience so <clears throat> so there may be some common areas but there may be also certain areas where you can say there are spiritual experiences that are more related also to certain <clears throat> inputs that you may have received from outside the most profound spiritual experiences the deepest spiritual experiences are are actually universal in nature the experience of being one with all the experience of um of, of sort of expanding and and being the universe you know this is a, a common spiritual experience that goes across all religions and then you may express it in different terms verses 10 to 12 placing his actions in brahman abandoning attachment he who performs action is not smeared by sin any more than a lotus leaf by water with the body with the mind with intelligence or with senses alone the yogis perform their actions abandoning attachment for the purification of themselves joined in yoga abandoning the fruits of action one attains the peace of those who have conviction one not joined in yoga acting out of desire and attached to fruits becomes bound so the lotus leaf have some of you seen the lotus the lotus leaf you know we say be like a lotus you know above the water but not in it the lotus leaf has very special qualities it is ultra hydrophobic <laughs> long word what does it mean ultra means high hydro is water phobic is aversion to that means the lotus leaf has certain qualities that repel water so you may have seen some pictures somewhere if you haven't seen real lotuses or lotus leaves in water they are almost circular the leaves they are very beautiful they are almost circular and if you throw water on them 
or if water splashes on them, the water pearls off. It becomes little, little, like little pearls and it pearls off. Some of you may know this effect from car washes. <laughs> they have lotus effect, you know, lotus car wash, at least here in Germany. And when you take your car through a lotus car wash, then when the water comes on it or dirt comes on your car, it just pearls off. And so the lotus leaf is a symbol. The lotus and the lotus leaf is a symbol. You're, it's in the water and yet it is not besmirched by the water. And so somebody who can witness, who really has that experience all the time of not being the doer, all the time, meditation and action, witnessing, he experiences this all like almost like a lotus leaf. Nothing sticks. No water, no the, the, the muddy waters of the world. Do not besmirch this person. He still remains pure. And so with his body or with his mind, with his senses, he can perform actions, but without attachment. By those who do not have that quality, they are not joined in yoga, they have not attained, they are acting out of desire. And these people become bound again and again. Again and again, strengthening these samskaras. The cycle continues. And then you are like a little insect that has fallen into the spider's web. The more you struggle, the more you get caught in that web. <clears throat> because all the actions come out of desire. And there is attachment to the result, to the fruits, that is, result. You are result-oriented in everything you do. Can you say really honestly and truthfully that there are certain things you like to do without the result? Is there something you like to do just because you like it, because you love it, you enjoy it? The moment you get caught in the result, you start suffering. That's where the problems start. One nice thing for everybody to do is to have a hobby. When we have a hobby, we just do it because we love it. Like gardening. Some people love gardening. They enjoy flowers. Some people just love trekking in nature. They go off and they can just keep walking for miles and miles and miles. You just do it because you enjoy it. That person is then living in the present, enjoying it. He's not bound by the fruit. It doesn't matter so much what happens, but that you just enjoy the act of it. Do it for the love of it. When that attitude if you could have that spilling over into your entire life, not just in your hobbies, but in all of your life, where you do all of your actions in that same spirit, not forced upon yourself this idea, okay, let me do this without thinking about the result, but you enjoy doing it. It's like sports. If you're a good sportsman, you simply enjoy the sport. And even if you lose at the end, you're a really good sportsman. You go and shake the hand of the, the other guy and, and say, hey, that was a great game. I really enjoyed myself. That was such a great game. That's 
the kind of spirit we are talking about, that would be meditation in action. So in our own way, we can try to bring this attitude, bhava, this spirit into our life. While at the same time, working through meditation and purifying the self. Any thoughts or questions on this? Okay, everybody is feeling very lotus-like. That's good. Verse 13. Again, an important verse. Renouncing all actions with the mind, the self-controlled one sits happily in the city with nine gates. The body bearer neither doing anything nor causing anything to be done. This is a description of the state that a witness would be in when he has attained that highest state. What is this city with nine gates? The body is considered to be the city with nine gates. Why is it got nine gates? Navdwara, that is nine gates. The nine gates are nine apertures. And they have been mentioned in older texts as well, like in the Upanishads in the Shivetashvara Upanishad, I think, in the Tripura Rahasya. And the nine gates are the two ears, the two eyes, the two nostrils, that's six already, the mouth, the anus, and the genitals. That makes it nine gates. The body is the city of nine gates. When we die, the Atman leaves through one of these gates. You may have heard of stories or you may have seen it maybe in films. Sometimes they have some dramatic death scenes <laughs> in Indian films. And you see the person dies there with his eyes open. Why are his eyes open? It has been observed that sometimes people die with their eyes open. The Atman, the soul, this Jivatman, has left through the eyes. Why through the eyes? Some people, when they die, they die with their mouth slightly open. The Jivatman has left through the mouth by the mouth. It leaves through different apertures depending on the strength or the conditioning of that particular gate. So if you're a very physical, uh, sorry, visually oriented person, like you like to see things, then that could be the reason why the Jivatma would leave from the eyes. If you like to talk a lot, then it could leave from the mouth. So, these are based on your Indriyas, Karma Indriyas, Jan Indriyas, depending on which of these are very powerful, which are very have a strong conditioning. 
there is still another gate, the tenth gate. Those who have attained, they leave through the tenth gate. The, the Atman, the free soul, leaves through the tenth gate. Fully purified Atman would then leave through the fontanel, the crown of the head, on the head, the Sahasrara chakra. And that is the tenth gate. But this is only those who leave consciously. It is said that when the soul or the Atman leaves the body consciously through the fontanel, through the Sahasrara Chakra, one actually hears a slight cracking sound. Why? Because you may have noticed there's actually no hole <laughs> on the head. So there is that slight noise. So it is said. So it's the body that is referred to as a city, the city of nine gates. So one who is a Jeevan monk, who is witnessing, he is the body bearer. He, he bears his body, he's, he's in the body, but he is not really causing anything to be done. He is just the witness. He is observing everything. And so this describes, once again, the same thing from a different perspective. So the Bhagavad Gita does repeat very often certain ideas which are very important are repeated again and again because the students, the seekers receive this in their own limited way and they need to hear this again and again with a period of time maybe get some insights, which is why there's a great value in going through scriptures repeatedly. And that is why it's an Indian tradition to slowly read, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita or other scriptures, little by little contemplate and keep doing it repeatedly over a period of time. Right. Any comments or questions about the body with the nine gates, the body of nine gates? Okay, everybody seems to be quite comfortable with that. Uh, Radhika? Yes. I've got a question. Uh -huh. Go um, is it possible to experience or see those uh, gates um, in uh, meditation or 61 points or anything like that? Hmm. Well, not that I am aware of. That would mean having a near-death experience. Is that what you're asking uh, about? Okay. Yeah? Okay, of course, yeah, by definition they are gates. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. What you mean. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not like energy uh, places in the body? Uh, no, no. Not like not, the chakras in yeah. the way. 
Yeah. Then everything is energy. Everything yeah. is energy. But experiencing those gates would be a near-death experience. That that would be then. Uh, well, if you come back, then you can tell us about it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we can end here and have a nice weekend, everybody. We continue then next Friday. And um, until then, bye bye. 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 Bye bye.